on, you're already on your feet. Can we take 10 seconds and praise Jesus? Has it even so good to you? Isn't he faithful? Isn't he good? Come on. We love you, Lord. Man, are you glad you made it to church today? So excited you guys are here. Stay standing for a second. Um, I want to welcome everybody who's watching. Uh, Brandon, North Tampa, Heights, St. Pete, here in South Tampa. And I also want to give a special shout out to everybody watching online. If you guys don't know, we have people watching literally around the world right now, um, part of our online location. Love you guys. Love that you guys are in the room today. Um, I want to take a moment. I don't want to let this moment pass um, without honoring, um, to give honor where honor is due. So Pastor Aaron, um, you have invested so much in John and I. You took a chance on a young kid who was in college um, and said, I, I'll pour in you, I'll, I'll develop you, I'll invest in you. And John and I came, served our faces off. And man, can I tell you guys, you have a lead pastor who is the same on the stage as he is behind the scenes. He loves Jesus, loves the Lord, leads so well. I think he's the best leader in the world. Can we honor him real quick today? Appreciate you and Katie so much. You guys can high five somebody and take your seat. I don't want to keep you standing too long. Man, I'm glad, I'm glad you're in the room today. I want to just give a little background. Um, me, we, John and I just became parents. Um, if you were not here, uh, we just dedicated our little baby girl. She is going to be three months on the 5th. We can put our picture up on the screen so everybody can see our cute little baby. She's so sweet. We love her. Riley and Louisa Bothy. Um, it means strong female warrior. No surprise there why we picked that name. Um, we love her. You can take her off the screen. I'll get distracted. Um, and actually, this service specifically, if you guys can help me, um, we actually have family here from Tallahassee, Texas, and Pennsylvania that made the trip just to be here to see her dedication. But selfishly, can you guys just cheer for them for making the drive? It's a big deal. Love you guys so much. And there's one last group that I want to honor, and that's everyone that... Um, you made the trip to come to Radiant for the first time. I um, came as an attender to church for the first time in my life a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm a church staff kid, um, so I was the kid always running around the pews and the chairs and falling asleep in church, eating all the church snacks. Um, but I came a couple weeks ago during my maternity leave and came as a parent to church. And if you made it in here, you got your kids ready. You chose to try a church for the first time. You showed up, which means you got dressed too. You got out the door. I just want to applaud you and say thanks for coming. It's a big deal. We've done everything all week with you in mind. We're honored that you're here. You're our guest. So Radiant, can we give it up for our first time guests today? It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And whatever room you're in right now, I want to take a moment and let you know that you're exactly where God has called you to be right now in this moment. It's not an accident that you're in the room. It's not an accident that you saw this scrolling on Facebook, that you saw an ad and decided to come check out Radiant Church. It's not just another Sunday. It's not just another message. God actually purposely put you right where you are right now to change. He has got a word for you today. So I'm going to encourage you. I know I'm not Pastor Aaron. Come back next week. You're stuck with this half Colombian, half New Jersey new mama with sparkly shoes on. But Lean in. Don't make this another Sunday. Do not make this another service. Lean in. If you've never taken notes before, take notes. Even if you weren't planning on it, take notes. If you usually tune out about two minutes in, tune in. God's got something for you today. So if you're a note taker, if you're not, take this note down. Uh, pull out the Radiant app or the notes you got when you walked in. The title for today is Enough is Enough. Say enough is enough. Enough is enough. I'm going to talk to you guys out of something God's been speaking to me about the last couple weeks. I'm going to get a little honest with you guys. Let's pray. Let's, let's put God first. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much. Thank you for your presence. God, where you are, lives change. Hearts can be healed. Things are made whole again. So God, we acknowledge your presence in every space. We ask that you would speak today. We ask that this wouldn't be just another moment, but this would be the moment that changes something in our lives forever. We acknowledge that you're good, that you are faithful, and you are here. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Hey, is anybody in here like an overpacker? You're always overprepared. When you go on a trip, you know what you guys know who I'm talking about because I always see you guys a baggage claim because you're like me. We always have way more than we need. Even if you go to like make a new recipe, I always get more than enough ingredients than I need. I just want to make sure in case I mess something up or in case I want to make it again, I want to make sure that I am prepared. I am an avid overpreparer. And so when John and I found out we were pregnant, um, we started getting ready and started preparing. 
And then we had to get, you know, a go bag to go to the hospital the closer that we got. And so I had about three bags. Um, I had a couple bags for her. And it was funny because I was already checked into the hospital at one point, And I was like, oh, we need to go get our bags. And John was like, you mean you need me to go get your bags and my one pair of sweatpants and my snacks? I was like, exactly. Everyone in the hospital is joking with us. If you're at St. Joseph's, love you guys. Um, because I had the whole security cart filled with all of my stuff. And I tell you, I used all of it. I am an over-preparer, but I was prepared. Um, so we were buying all this stuff. We bought more than enough clothes, more than enough baby things. And there's so many things you need when you have a child. And it's crazy because then you have this moment where you go into the hospital as two people. And then they say it's time to check out, which sounds all great until they leave you (laughs) with this new person at your car. And they're like, okay, you have to get out of the wheelchair now and you have to actually go raise this child. I'm like, I need to go back and check myself in a couple more days. I don't know what I'm doing. I felt like I was not prepared enough. And then you get home and you're like, my house isn't clean enough. I don't have enough diapers. How many diapers can one human being go through? I don't have enough stuff. I don't have enough clothes. I don't have enough. And then I started thinking, I I don't know if I'm enough. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. I don't know. There's not a handbook they give you on the way out of the hospital on how to raise a human being. I'm like, Lord, I've got the Bible, but if you could give me some really good instructions on what to do when she blows out a diaper, it'd be helpful. Um, But maybe for you, that moment wasn't when you brought home a child from the hospital, but maybe it was when you felt like 2020 took everything from you and you felt like, I am not enough for this. Maybe it was that relationship that failed or maybe it was when you thought you were over that thing and then it came back and you're like, ah, oh, I'm still in this. I, I'm, I'm not enough. I don't have enough for this. I, I can't do it. I'm not enough. Don't have enough. Can't do enough to get out of this by myself. And it reminds me of a story in the Bible of a guy named Gideon. Say Gideon. Gideon. It's a good name if you're named Gideon in here. So Gideon, let me give you a little bit of context. So Gideon, we find him in our story in Judges chapter 6. I encourage you to go read this story this week. The Bible's amazing. Take some time and invest in reading the Bible. And in Judges chapter 6, we find Gideon. Now before we get into the passage of Scripture, I want to give you some context. So he's hiding. He's hiding away doing normal, mundane tasks, just ordinary, run-of-the-mill things. And an angel appears to him, which is crazy. I don't know if you've had an angel appear to you. I have haven't had that in the last couple weeks. Um, So I don't know about you, but this is a pretty crazy moment. And before we get into it, this is how he's addressed by the angels. Judges chapter 6, verse 12. The angel says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I don't know how you would respond to that. But if I was hiding, doing normal, like let's say laundry, and a big angel showed up and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, I would be a little afraid. I also might say, I think you have the wrong person. And then he goes on to say, Judges chapter 6, let's start at verse 14. This is what he said. He said, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you'll strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. It's pretty bad when the Bible gives that as like the description of who you are. I'm the least of the least. I'm the lowest in my family. I I have nothing. I think there's some people in here today that you feel like that. You feel like the least of the least. You feel like everything in life's been stacked against you. Your family history that you didn't have a say in is stacked against you. And you hear me saying that God might call you a mighty warrior and you're from the get-go or like, no, 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 you've got the wrong person. And I think you're exactly who God is speaking to today. You're writing your notes this way. Let's, let's talk about an equation here because me plus anything, leave that blank, equals lacking. So Gideon plus his hiding, his family history, the way he felt about himself, yeah, all of that is going to leave you feeling like you're not enough, like you're lacking something. That's the whole point God's really been teaching you in life is that the whole point is that you're never going to feel on your own like you have enough. You can try to get the promotion, try to get the spouse by the age of whatever age you're supposed to get married because everybody says you're supposed to get married. Have the kid on the timeline you're supposed to have a kid. Have all the finances, have everything in the world, and you're still going to feel like you're lacking because you're missing something. Here, here's the next equation. Write in your notes because me plus God will always equal more than enough. You will always have more than you think that you need when you have God. Let me tell you a story. When John and I were transitioning from our last job to working here at Radiant, we did the math yesterday. There's about four weeks that we were going to go between paychecks. Um, and you guys who are adults in here know that four weeks means there's a rent 
bill in there. There's car insurance. There's all the insurance, renter's insurance. Um, we are avid Disney people, so our Disney Pass payment was in there. Not a necessity, but hey. Um, and so, you know, four weeks go by, and when you're not going to have a paycheck, that's a little scary. Some of you guys, you might have experienced that in 2020. So I remember John and I were like, okay, we're, we're going to pray. And because all we see is a lack of finances, a lack of ability to be able to get to that next paycheck. And can I tell you something? And I've never shared this publicly before, ever. Every time we checked our bank account, rent came out, there was still money. We'd go and get groceries, there was still money. Our auto insurance came out, there was still money. We know that we didn't have enough. But write it in your notes this way, because when we see lack, God sees opportunity. He's like, oh, you, you think you don't have enough in your bank account? Let me show you how I am the God who is your provider. Oh, you think that marriage is too far gone? Oh, let me show you that I'm the God who restores. Oh, you think those kids are too far gone? Let me show you how I'm going to redeem that situation. Because where we see lack, God will always see opportunity. Every single time you see lack in your life, can I encourage you? Lean into that moment because God might be up to something. See, Gideon thought he wasn't enough. There was no way God could use me. And he said, oh, watch how I'll use you. You watch how I'll use you. We're going to get into a little bit more of his story a little bit later. And a lot of times we think we need a lot, right? Like we must need a lot of faith. We must need a lot of, you know, amazing family history to be a Christian. A lot of perfect in our school records. Can I tell you, God's not looking for a lot. In Luke chapter 17, he actually tells us what he's looking for. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, as small, as just a little. Can, can we put the picture of a mustard seed up on the screen so everybody can see what a mustard seed looks like? That's a mustard seed. That's the size that God chose to use. I don't know about you. If I'm going to pick a seed, I'm probably going to pick something bigger. <laughs> I don't know, pumpkin, something, something that's bigger. And God said, if you have this much faith, I can't have a lot of faith sometimes, but I can do a little bit of faith. And you know what's amazing is God gave us a whole Bible that when we don't have the words, we don't even have enough words to say. We don't have a lot of things to give to God. He's given us promises we can speak back to him. So we can say, you know what, God? I don't got a lot of faith, but it says in your word, if I have faith as small as a mustard seed, I can say to a tree, be uprooted and be planted and it will obey you. So I can say to that marriage, be restored in the name of Jesus. And it has to be restored. I can look at my past and say, you have to be redeemed in the name of Jesus because I am forgiven and I can have a little bit of faith. It doesn't take a lot of faith to just read the word of God back to him. You can write in your notes this way. God doesn't call the qualified. I think a lot of times we think we have to have it all together. We have to look good enough, have a good enough history, have enough money in the bank account. He doesn't need that. He qualifies the called. That area that you think unqual- disqualifies you from what God wants to do through your life actually qualifies you to be the very person God wants to do a miracle through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. You want to know what that word sufficient means? It's not going to be very surprising. I'm not a very mind-blowing note person here. Sufficient means enough. So I don't have to have enough. I don't have to be enough. I don't have to know enough because his grace is enough. I think the entire point of life is that we're not ever going to have enough on our own. But when we partner with the God of the universe, we have access to everything that we could ever need. We're never supposed to understand it. So what are you supposed to do with all this? Like, thank you, Sarah, for telling me that I am not enough. That's a very uplifting message for today. (laughs) I'm going to give you three very practical things. They're not going to be very mind-blowing, but they're going to be things that you can walk out of here and say, you know what? If I can do these three things, I think God could do a miracle. Just these three, they're very basic. Number one, just be who God has created you to be. Don't try to do what you think you're supposed to be. Don't try to become what everybody else tells you to become. You know, there's two groups of people when you hear, be who God has created you to be. The first group, you think, oh, well, I'm a nobody. You're the the Gideon. I'm I'm nobody. I I should just be in the back. I'm the lowest of the low. You know, growing up, a lot of people spoke over me. Wow, Sarah, this is funny. You're so quiet. (laughs) You're so shy. I actually remember my mom went to a parent-teacher conference, and they were like, you know, sometimes it's crazy. Like, I just don't even know she's there. Like, she's just so quiet. They're like, oh my goodness, she talks so much. Just kidding. We've never heard her open her mouth. And I heard that spoken over me so many times that then when I went into asking God, what do you want me to do with my life? I thought it had to be, oh, I have to be quiet. 
I, I have to be, I have to be in the back. Like God could never use me to lead or speak or do anything. And you hear be who God has created you to be. And you hear that and you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll just hang out in the back. And I think you're the one that God is looking at and saying, Gideon, I've called you to be a mighty warrior. You were never called to be in the back or to be a back row Christian. You were called to lead from the front. You were called to lead and set the example for your family, for your friends of what it looks like when somebody is called by God. And then the second group people, you hear be who God has created you to be. And you're so busy being who everybody else thinks you should be that you don't even know who God has created you to be. You're so focused on what, what your boss is telling you to be, what your friends are telling you to be, what South Howard on Friday night is telling you to be, what all of Instagram, social media, TikTok is telling you to be, what it takes to get that promotion to be, the little slight cheating you can do to get where you want to be. You're so focused on everything else. Of course you're not going to hear what God wants you to be above all that noise. And I want to tell you something. The only opinion that matters at the end of the day is God's opinion of you. Write it in your notes this way. The only applause we're meant to seek is that of the nail-scarred hands. The only applause that matters is the one who sent his son to die a death that we all deserve to pay the price for our mistakes. That's the one that I want to make sure he's happy with me at the end of the day. And can I tell you something? When God's happy with you, you can sleep better at night. When you're being who God has created you to be, that's everything you're supposed to be. And let me let you in on a little bit of a secret here on what the Bible tells you that you are. He says in his word that we are blessed. He says we're highly favored. He says we are victorious. He says we are strong. We are chosen. We are seen. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are made on purpose for a purpose. So we should start to walk like it. Just be who God has created you to be. That's a pretty good profile right there. That's who I want to be. So just be who God has created you to be. So Gideon's told to be a mighty warrior. Let's go on. So, so anybody do a relay race? You guys remember those back in elementary school and they like give you the baton, you like run um, and you do something and then you pass the baton. I hated those growing up. It was so much pressure because if you were the one person, you guys know, you remember one time that one person on your team messed it up for everybody. If you're that one, I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to do something wrong. And maybe you feel like you're juggling lots of things in your life is a relay race and you're just afraid of dropping the baton. Let me give you some encouragement today. Number two, just do what God has asked you to and nothing else. I even felt a little convicted writing that because I think a lot of times we think we're supposed to do so much more than what God asks us to do. We put so much pressure on ourselves. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Does it say every work? Does it say all the work? Does it say we're supposed to do everything on our own and hope that God is happy with us at the end of the day? No, it says we're supposed to do good works. So do you want to know how to know the good works that God asks you to do? Ready? Ask him. Really good. Just ask. God is not trying to hide his plans from you. He's not some God in the background saying, oh, I hope you figure it out. I hope you can figure it out on your own. He just says, ask me. And you know what a great opportunity is to ask him? Starting next one week is 21 days of prayer. Get yourself in the room. Get yourself in front of God and say, God, what would you have me do? Because it says in his word that when we come close to him, he comes close to us. And I believe he's going to be waiting for some people at 6 a.m. saying, are you going to show up? I'm waiting. I want to tell you what to do. I want to tell you how much I love you. Are you going to come? Just ask him. He wants you to know. He's not trying to hide. And number three, this last one, maybe you feel like, okay, I can be who God has created me to be. I can do what he's asked me to do, but I don't have much. I don't have a lot to offer the God of the universe. That's okay. Number three, just use what God has already given you. Just use what he's given you. So let me tell you about Gideon, that story I referenced earlier. So Gideon goes, he's told, you know, I'm going to set these people free. I better go get an army. He gets an army of over 22,000 men. And you know what God says? You have too many people. I don't know about you, but I I want overprepared. I want to have more than enough people. I want to make sure that if I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to win. And God's like, no, no, then where's the room for me in that? You could take the credit if you feel like you have everything you need. No, no. So he says, Gideon, I need you to reduce this army. So he reduces it, reduces it, gets it all the way down to 300 people. 300. That's it. I don't know about you, but most of us, if we got down to 300 
we'd be like, you know what? Maybe I'm the wrong person. Maybe the angel stopped by the wrong house. Maybe I am not qualified for this because I don't have enough. But he didn't do that. And let me let you in on the rest of the story. He won. And let me let you in on the end of your story. Ready for this? You're on the winning team. We already know the end of this story. The Bible already says how the end is going to go. So when you're partnered with God, you're already on the winning team. Romans 8.37 says in all these things, in all of 2020, in all of the way your marriage feels, in all of your bankruptcy, the, the feelings of desperation and depression and anxiety and fear. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So are we going to be people that take God at his word and say, okay, if I am, then use what I've got. And if you're being honest, maybe you feel like it's a little. Maybe you're like, I don't have a lot to offer God. It's not enough. I don't have enough. I'm going to tell you a couple stories real quick about God using things that didn't look like enough. Lainey, can you bring up our first little thing? Because sometimes we think we have to have all this stuff. Let me show you our first little. Here, show those little fish to everybody because they're cute. Okay, so this is the point. I'm a church kid, so you're all getting hungry, right? I know where y'all at in the service. You're all hungry. You're thinking, where are we going to eat? So if I was to tell you, I have enough to feed all of you and then some, you'd probably be expecting more than some fish and some bread, right? There's a story in the Bible. Over 5,000 men were listening, so about 10,000 plus people were listening to Jesus teach. And then it came time, everybody gets hungry, right? After you hear a good sermon, you get hungry. And he's like, well, where are we going to feed all these people with? And this kid comes up and says, I don't have much. I've got some fish and some bread. He's like, is that enough? Jesus says, oh, yeah, it is. And he fed every single person and there were leftovers, which amen for leftovers. They are a blessing from the Lord. If we even looked in the room, we would think this isn't enough. But the faith that that kid had, I'm going to give you this bread back. The faith that that kid had to even offer it to Jesus Shows that he can do so much more with our little. Let's go to the next one. Maybe you still don't believe. Oh, bread and fishes. That's cute, Sarah. I'm still going to go get bar taco and go have food after this, and, and it's fine. Let me show you something else. You want to talk about not enough. This is a jar of dirt. There's nothing else. Some of you guys are like, what is in that? It's just dirt. <laughs> There's a guy who had been born blind. He came to Jesus. He wanted to get healed. All Jesus saw was some dirt. So not very COVID friendly, but he spit in it. And I really wanted to do this with you. And I really wanted to spit in this dirt and put it on your face, but I don't think you'd appreciate it. He just spit in some dirt, made some mud, put it on the man's eyes, said, go wash it off. Now, a lot of us would leave that and be like, well, this guy's crazy. Like, there's no way a miracle can come out of that. And can I tell you the end of that story? He was healed because of a little dirt and some spit. All of you have more than a little dirt and some spit. That's gross. Okay, let's do another one. Because I, I, maybe you still got some walls up with me. Maybe you're still like, oh, I don't have that much. I want to show you the moment that changed history. This is two pieces of wood. I've got some nails. That's all I have. Now, I'm not a builder. I'm not into construction. If my shoes didn't tell you that, I will tell you that. Um, I, I don't know if you could even make a table with this or a chair. I, I don't know what you could do with some wood and nails. Now let me tell you what Jesus did with this. Because when Jesus came down to this earth, he hung on some wood and let them put nails in his hands, in his feet. And he took on every mistake everything you think disqualifies you, all the past, all the pain. He took everything on himself. He's like, this doesn't look like much, but this is enough to take on all the mistakes you've ever done, redeem it, and give you a new plan and have a relationship with me. God took some wood and some nails and changed history. We're here today because of some wood and some nails. We're in a church because Jesus has wood and nails, that's enough. And I don't know what you have, but I guarantee it's more than some wooden nails. I don't know what you have. Probably more than some fish. And that's all that God needs. That's more than enough to do a miracle. That is more than enough to change history. So wherever you're at, stand up. We're going to sing this song and believe whatever grave you're in is going to become a garden. That God can do more than enough with whatever you have. Come on, let's sing this out.
I've never given him my little bit. I thought I didn't have enough, thought I wasn't put together enough, thought I, I just had too much of a history. You just never thought that you could have a relationship with God. I'm here to tell you that you're the exact person that he wants to talk to today. He wants your little. He wants it. He wants to have a relationship with you. That's why he came. So everybody just close your eyes for me. Take a moment. And if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus. You want to commit to the more than enough that he has for you. You, You're making the decision today to give him the rest of your days. I'm going to count to three. Just raise your hand when I get to three. No one looking around. It's just a decision between you and Jesus. One, two, three. If you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, come on. He sees your hand. It's not just a little. He's going to do a miracle with your life. So you can put your hands down. You're going to repeat a prayer after me. We're all going to say it though. And just know that when you're talking, you're talking right to God. He hears you. So guys, repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus. Oh, come on. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for my mistakes. I'm sorry for the mistakes I've made. Would you forgive me? I choose today to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we go crazy for those people that just made that decision today?